Craft Computing, the only place on the internet where you'll find AMD's fine wine and a barrel-aged barley wine all under one roof. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Today marks the launch of AMD's Ryzen 7 9800X3D, and to say the world is a bit anxious about this release would be quite the understatement. Gamers were understandably let down by AMD's claims that Zen 5 chips would be the world's fastest gaming CPUs, only to have them still land slightly behind the previous generation Ryzen 7800X3D. Couple that with the disappointment of Intel's Arrow Lake chips regressing a bit due to their new ground-up architecture, and you wind up with a crowd of enthusiasts that's clamoring for more power. AMD's Zen 5 X3D CPU might be the worst-kept secret in recent memory. Today is finally the day that we get to find out, does it bring all the performance improvements that we've been looking for? While drag racing PC hardware is always fun, today I'm not going to be answering the question, what is the top performance gaming CPU? Rather, I'm going to be answering more of a real world question. If you're building a brand new gaming PC right now and you don't have unlimited money, should you buy the all new Ryzen 9800X3D or would you be better off with the less expensive, but still quite good Ryzen 9700X? It's pretty obvious if you have RTX 4090 money, you're going to want a CPU that allows it to chew through as many frames as possible. And sure, setting your PC to 1080p low settings and ripping off a thousand frames per second in Doom Eternal and Rocket League is fun as hell. But that's just not how people play games with high-end GPUs. Nor is the RTX 4090 a GPU that many people can afford. And I'd rather give advice that's rooted in actual gameplay and based around resolutions and quality settings you'll actually be using in games. Outside of budget setups and 500Hz competitive gaming, 1080p is officially dead as a resolution. If you don't believe me, look no further than the plethora of 1440p 144Hz panels available for under $150 right now. Full disclosure before we get completely into this one, AMD did send over the Ryzen 7 9800X3D for this review, along with the ROG Crossfire X870 Hero motherboard, 32GB of G-Skill DDR5 6000 memory, and a Samsung 990 Pro SSD. For this comparison, I purchased the 9700X out of my own pocket. Like all reviews on this channel, no money changed hands, AMD has no input over the production of this video, nor will they get to see it before it goes live on YouTube. We start off today talking about the RTX 4090 for a very good reason. If you want to benchmark a gaming CPU, you have to eliminate GPU bottlenecks, right? Well, if your question is, what is the fastest CPU on the market? you're 100% correct. And you can get a great deal right now on MSI's Trifrozer 3 RTX 4090 as it's just $1,949 on Amazon. Most models though seem to cost right around $2,400 with Founders Editions cards available for the low, low price of just $2,599. $2,400 is not only more than the trade-in value of my car, you could also easily build a top flight gaming PC for that same price. And that's where the question for today's video got started. In a $2,400 gaming PC, do you need to buy the world's fastest CPU, or is it only a requirement for systems that also have the world's fastest GPU alongside them? Specifically today, we'll be testing both the Ryzen 9700X and the 9800X3D with 32GB of DDR5 6000 memory and an RTX 4070 Ti Super, a card priced at just $800. I've ran both CPUs through a set of compute and gaming tests to show off both the strengths and weaknesses of both CPUs. And I know this won't be controversial at all, we will be testing all games today at 1440p and either high or ultra settings. But why? I can hear a lot of you already asking. Won't that just introduce a GPU bottleneck and completely invalidate your testing? It's definitely possible that we see no difference between these two CPUs when running games at these settings. And that's kind of the point of testing like this. I'm not trying to determine which CPU is better under ideal circumstances. I'm trying to determine which CPU is the best match for the RTX 4070 Ti Super under real world conditions. If the 4070 Ti Super is the bottleneck, that means you don't have to spend the extra $165 on the X3D CPU. And that's why I'm performing this test. With that out of the way, let's get into today's testing. AMD's X3D CPUs utilize additional L3 cache on the CPU to accelerate certain workloads. The Ryzen 9700X is no slouch with 32 megabytes of L3 cache on board, but it still pales in comparison to the 96 megabytes of the 9800X3D. But the additional cache comes with a trade-off, as X3D CPUs also have slightly lower boost clocks. 
The 9700X can boost all the way to 5.5 GHz, while the 9800X 3D tops out at just 5.2. While AMD's X3D chips often hold a decided edge in gaming workloads, they're often at a bit of a disadvantage in professional and compute heavy tasks. Both CPUs today are going to be run at 100% stock settings on the same motherboard with the same 6000 mega transfers per second memory. The only tweak that I made was to the 9700X where I enabled the 105 watt TDP mode that launched shortly after the release of the CPU. In my compute testing, the 9700X reached a max draw of 142 watts and a max clock speed of 5.5 GHz for single-threaded tasks and 5.2 GHz for multi-threaded tasks, and it had no trouble holding 142 watts for the duration of every single test that I ran. Meanwhile, the 9800X 3D drew about 10 watts more power during these tests, hitting 152 watts and holding that for the duration of all of my compute testing. Running both CPUs through Cashbench, we can also see another reason for some performance differences between these two chips, as while the 9800X 3D has three times the cache of the 9700X, it's also around 7% slower in cache operations. Applications that take advantage of the extra capacity are going to see substantial improvements in performance over the 9700X, but frequent writes or modifications to the cache also comes with a pretty hefty penalty. I ran through three different versions of Cinebench, along with Blender and 7-Zip to show how these potential differences stack up, and the results are pretty mixed, if I'm being honest. In Cinebench R15, R23, and 2024, the results all follow the same trend. Multi-threaded performance on the 9800X 3D is slightly faster than on the 9700X, by around 2.9% on average. The difference here being that the 9800X 3D was actually able to hold a 5.25 GHz all-core boost clock, even under AVX workloads, while the 9700X was a bit closer to 5.1 GHz during these tests. Single-threaded performance is basically the opposite result, with the 9700X leading by around 4.5% on average, with the CPU able to hit the 5.5 GHz mark. 7-Zip compression testing was a wash, with the 9700X and 9800X 3D scoring within 0.1% of each other on average across nine individual test runs. And finally, we come to Blender, where I ran both the BMW and Classroom benchmarks. Here, the 9800X 3D takes the overall win, clocking in at around 2.8% faster in the BMW test and 1.7% faster during the Classroom render. Overall, performance in all of my compute testing was within 3 or 4% of each other, and still only represents strenuous workloads when you're asking 100% utilization out of your CPU. In my mind, that makes all of these results virtually identical, as unless you're recompiling the Linux kernel multiple times per day, you're not likely to hold your CPU at 100% utilization during normal use. In Blender, we're talking about a difference of 5 seconds over a 5 minute test, which means you're not going to get more work done in a professional application using one CPU over the other. But of course, you're likely here for the gaming benchmarks, as the 9800X 3D is expected to be the world's fastest gaming CPU, right? Based on my testing here today, there is a clear winner, which I think shows why testing every scenario is important, not just isolating CPUs to determine the best raw performance. But we'll get into that in just a minute. Starting with synthetic testing in 3 Mark, I usually like to go test by test and talk about the differences and nuances that I observe. But in virtually every test today, we see the 9800X 3D come out on top by about 0.5%. There were two exceptions to that, with the TimeSpy Extreme's CPU test giving a 0.6% edge to the 9700X, and Steel Nomad doing that in the full system benchmark. Moving into actual games, let's start with a title that is likely CPU limited even at 4K and Ultra settings in Counter-Strike 2. Here at 1440p and Ultra settings, we see the 9700X manage 334 frames per second on average, a 1% low of 103, and a 0.1% low of 80. Not too much to complain about there. But I wanted to show Counter-Strike 2 first, as the 9800X 3D scores one of its biggest wins of the day here, beating the 9700X by 15% with an average of 385 frames per second, and improving on the lows by nearly 30%, at 132 and 104 FPS respectively. Those are massive improvements, and certainly worthy of an upgrade to a 9800X 3D if you play CS2 competitively. But like I said, Counter-Strike was an outlier and had the biggest win of the day for the 9800X 3D, a game that can run on a literal potato and still manage 100 FPS on average. What about more graphically intensive games? We'll start with Cyberpunk 2077, as it doesn't get much more intense than this. At 1440p and high settings, the difference between these CPUs in average frame rates is less than 1%, with 122 FPS on average for the 9700X and 121 FPS on average for the 9800X 3D. 
But it's the low frame rates here that impress me. The 9800X3D improves the 1% low from 78 to 86 frames per second, and the 0.1% low from 63 to 66. What makes a game feel less stuttery is not the average frame rate, but the massive changes between frame times. A game can average 120 frames per second, but if it constantly hits 60 FPS on the low end of things, that means one full dropped frame for every second of gameplay. The 9800X3D proved to be around 10% faster in the low frame rates, and thus delivers a smoother experience. Another great example of this is Starfield at 1440p and high settings, which takes a surprising amount of horsepower to run well. Just like Cyberpunk, we see the average frame rate score within 1% of each other on both CPUs, but again the 9800X3D has a massive advantage in low frame times. The 9700X manages a 1% low of 64 and a 0.1% low of 41. Not a terrible result, but a low of 40 would have me considering bumping a couple graphics settings up to compensate. But the 9800X3D shows some massive gains here, with a 1% low of 82 and a 0.1% low of 61. That's an improvement over the 9700X by 28 and 51% respectively, and a definite feather in the cap for the 9800X3D. Not every title was able to take advantage of the extra cache space, though. Sometimes, raw CPU performance is actually what's needed to make a game chooch, and that's the case for Tiny Tina's Wonderlands. Here at 1440p and ultra settings, we see the 9700X manage an average of 188 frames per second versus 183 FPS on the 9800X3D, or a difference of around 3%. Low frame rates also fell slightly short for the X3D chip as well, coming in around 4% slower than the 9700X. Though I'd argue in a Pepsi challenge scenario, there's not a single person who would accurately choose one CPU over another, as we're talking about a difference of 1.2 milliseconds between frames in the 0.1% lows, and just 0.2 milliseconds on average. Sorry, the majority of us just aren't superhuman. Moving on to racing titles, Wreckfest is a destruction derby title with up to 24 cars on the same course, along with full rendered vehicle deformation. It needs a decently fast CPU to play well. At 1440p and ultra settings, it's a virtual tie between the 9700X and 9800X3D. While the X3D did win all three tests, it was by a difference of just 3% on average, and at 417 frames per second, there's hardly any difference between the two chips. Sticking with racing, let's move on over to Project Cars 3, where the 9800X3D had the biggest impact of the day. I know I said Counter-Strike was the biggest win, but that was only for the average frame rate. In Project Cars, the 9700X manages 308 frames per second on average, a 1% low of 214, and a very impressive 0.1% low of 117. Meanwhile, the 9800X3D shows off why it's the fastest gaming chip that ever was, by notching an average of 341 frames per second, a 1% low of 268, and showing off a massive 78% improvement to the 0.1% lows with a score of 208 frames per second. And finally, we wrap up our gaming testing with Helldivers 2, where the 9700X proves it's still one of the fastest gaming chips ever made. At 1440p and ultra settings, it manages 142 FPS on average, with a 1% low of 116 and a 0.1% low of 108. Fantastic numbers if you're playing on a 144Hz monitor. Like a couple other titles here today though, the 9800X3D is the more consistent performer. It came in around 2.7% slower at 138 FPS, but the lows both improved by around 8% each, up to 125 and 117 frames per second respectively. Putting all of my gaming benchmarks together, if the general consensus of you can only benchmark a CPU by eliminating bottlenecks were true, all of my results would be identical, right? Instead, we see on average the 9800X3D is faster than the 9700X by around 3.2%. Now, Counterpoint to myself, I consider all results within 5% of each other to be identical in terms of end user perception. So yes, on average, there's no difference between the 9700X and the 9800X3D. Checkmate, Jeff. But that's only looking at the average frame rates. If you look at the 1% and 0.1% lows, there is a very clear winner here, as the 9800X3D outperformed the 9700X by 14 and 24% respectively. In terms of overall experience, that is a massive difference, as games were smoother and more predictable. In Counter-Strike, I felt like I was aiming more consistently, which leads to higher kill rates, which leads to better scores. So, where does that leave us? 
Assuming a $2,000 plus dollar budget for a gaming PC where you're happy to drop $800 on a graphics card, should you spring for a Ryzen 9800X 3D over the Ryzen 9700X? The Ryzen 9700X is only $325 on Amazon as of the time of filming, and despite reviews complaining about only 5% improvement over the last generation, is a solid performer in its own right. It had no trouble at all driving CPU-intensive games well above 100 frames per second, and was more than enough CPU for an RTX 4070 Ti at 1440p. The Ryzen 7 9800X 3D launches today for $489, a full $165 more expensive than the 9700X. On average, it's only around 3% faster in gaming, and it can be plus or minus 3% in compute-heavy workloads. But at 1440p and high or ultra settings, it completely normalizes the average and low frame rates in some games. Counter-Strike saw a 29% improvement in the 1 and 0.1% lows. Project Cars 3 saw a 78% improvement. Starfield saw a 51% improvement. And this was at game settings that you'll actually be using on your gaming machine, and therefore actual results that you can expect. It remains to be seen if the previous generation Ryzen 7800X 3D will be available long term, or if we'll see a price drop in the near future. Right now, it's still sitting at $476 on Amazon, which makes that a very easy choice to snag a 9800X 3D instead. I would want to see the 7800X 3D drop to about $375 for it to make sense to me over either the 9700X or the 9800X 3D. Hopefully you enjoyed this look at performance differences between the 9700X and the 9800X 3D on an actual graphics card you can afford with actual settings that you'll be running in games. If you like these kinds of reviews, make sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Blue Sky at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, head on over to craftcomputing.store where we've got bottle openers, custom glassware, coasters, and everything else you need to start drinking like a pro. And that's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. Might have spoiled it in the intro, but today's beer is Freem's Barrel-Aged Bourbon Barrel Barley Wine, clocking in at 11%. As much as I love verbose, descriptive beer labels, uh, Freem, this one feels like you button mashed a thesaurus. Bourbon Barley Wine Ale is spicy and a bit surly, a beautifully big sipper with soft hints of caramel, baking spice, and oak. Spicy and impetuous now, with years of aging, this big brew will mellow with transcendent complexity and luscious mouthfeel. You said nothing other than spicy and caramel. I can tell you one thing, barley wine was a good choice for this video. I had a 2023 bourbon barley wine from Frame uh, right after I bought it. I usually buy these bottles in pairs, and then I will drink one, and then I will age one. This one, I think I stated, it definitely needed some more time to breathe. I, I opened it, I think, on an episode of Talking Heads uh, early, early this year. Uh, this particular one was bottled in August 11th of 2023, so it's been aging for about 14 months in the bottle now. This is a darn good barley wine. If there's a word that describes the flavor accurately, it's fig. It's very figgy forward. If there's one way I can describe this beer right now in its current state that is aging an additional 14 months past the bottling date. God, this is the perfect winter warmer. I want nothing more than to pour a full glass of this, head on upstairs, sit down in my easy chair, light a roaring fire, and watch a replay of the Detroit Lions beating the Cowboys at home on Jerry Jones's birthday. It fills me with so many warm feelings, I can't even describe it.